Welcome to the 11th episode of the Wild World of Bees, and this is the final episode of the season. So thank you for joining us once again and for supporting the program. If you've been here before, you know that I'm your host, Lincoln Best. I'm a native bee taxonomist that supports the Oregon Bee Atlas and Master Melatologist program here at Oregon State University. And this program, The Wild World of Bees, is an online lecture series you can enjoy from the comfort of home. Through this series, we'll hear from great bee researchers and native bee advocates from around North America and the world. Often we have a closer focus to us here in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon. This month, they're calling in from, I think, Northern Utah. That's correct. <laughs> This series is brought to you by the Oregon Bee Atlas, a citizen science-based initiative to document the bee fauna and its floral relations in Oregon. The Oregon Bee Atlas is the biodiversity-focused arm of the Oregon Bee Project, a partnership between OSU Extension, the Oregon Department of Forestry, and the Oregon Department of Agriculture. The Bee Project is dedicated to pollinator health in the state. This series is sponsored by Mount Pisgah Arboretum in Eugene, Oregon, the USDA NEFA Pollinator Health Grant, and the Native Bee Society of British Columbia. You can visit their website, bcnativebees.org, to learn more. And if you're in Washington State, I have recently heard that they've incorporated a new bee society, so keep your ears open for news about that. In our last episode, I had the pleasure of hosting myself, <laughs> a new to Oregon Canadian bee taxonomist with winter dreams of summer field work. Um, I took you folks on a tour of the data our Bee Atlas members have generated for more than two dozen species of bumblebees in the state. And you can find my talk on our Oregon Bee Atlas YouTube channel. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Now, coming up, in a few weeks is the annual bee vent. And this is on March 6th. It's a seasonal celebration of all things plants and bees. So if you head over to the Lynn County Master Gardeners website that you can see here, um, you can register. There's a great lineup of speakers, including Terry's um, Logan Bee Lab alum, Jim Kane, who is one of my favorite speakers. Mason Bee Guru, Catherine LaCroix will be speaking. Um, Master Naturalist August Jackson will be speaking, and I will be too. So hurry up and register, register now. You don't want to miss it. And that's coming up in a few weeks. This evening, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce <laughs> Terry Griswold, a research scientist with the USDA ARS in Logan, Utah. Now, Terry is among a small suite of leading global bee taxonomists and systematists, um, I mean, among other uh, research talents. He's been an active mentor to a whole generation of bee scientists, like you can see in this photo. And he has published hundreds of scholarly articles and thousands of pages. I had the pleasure of chatting with Terry a few weeks ago and <laughs> mentioned the, the first bee that he ever discovered, which was this one, Hoplitis emarginata. And as it turned out, um, the Oregon Bee Atlas had just recently discovered this rare bee in 2020 from the Siskiyou's north along the crest of the Cascades in Oregon, um, where it harvests pollen exclusively from what appears to be a single species of sedum or stone crop. And so, of course, Terry had published a taxonomic treatment of this whole group um, in 1983. And so this year I had the the, the fun of figuring out which strange Acrosmia species this was that our Atlas members had discovered. So if you're on YouTube, um, check, I suggest checking out this super cool video about a bunch of new species that were discovered by Zach Portman and Terry um, in the US Southwest. The video is super good. And so if you just copy that title and search it, you'll find it. It's, the images are amazing. It's got some little natural history tidbits. Um, if you're looking for more identification and taxonomy resources, head over to idtools.org, an awesome resource put together by Skylar Burroughs, Terry, and several others. Um, the content and photos are as good as it gets. So, 
Um, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce you, Terry. And if anyone has any questions, I'll moderate a question and answer period at the end of Terry's talk. And please put those into the Q&A section that you see at the bottom of your screen anytime during the talk, and we'll get to those at the end. So with that, Terry, I'll uh, let you share your screen and you can take over. So we know the world from our perspective, but what does a V-centric view of the world look like? And I, I can't claim to know for sure, but maybe we can observe together. We know our species, its distribution can clearly be seen even from space here with light pollution as the proxy. We are densely abundant along the coasts and much of the interior east with rich centers of diversity and cities lining our coasts. But how does the world look from the perspective of the, of the 4,870 known species of North American bees? or really the undoubtedly more than 5,000 species if we were able to include the unknown and undescribed. Where are they found? What are their centers of diversity? And what are their habits? So this is the face of the Americas from the bees perspective. It's a celebration of diversity. And tonight I want to celebrate with you our incredible diversity of winged pollinators. In addition, this will be a journey of discovery. Discovery is such an exciting part of life and, and has been of my in my personal journey. And, and I wanna share that, some of that with you. But it's not a solo journey. It's also about the journeys of students, colleagues, and even an institution. The USDA ARS Insects Research Unit. So how did I end up here? I don't know. But, but as a kid, I can remember, um, well, my parents were both teachers. My grandmother was a teacher. I was gonna be a teacher, I knew that. I was gonna teach in high school. And, and um, I had the opportunity for two summers in a row to go with my father with, and Papa had, was taking classes in, in biology on, at the field station on the Mendocino coast. I went along. I helped out, trap mammals, um, plant, press plants, wandered around in tide pools, but the part that really enjoyed me the most, that I enjoyed the most was the bee part. They're not really bees at that time, I didn't really know them, but insects in general, the colorful ones. And so I helped him with that, that collecting. And, and when we got back to, to home, which was in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, a little town called Applegate, the population then of 200 and um, a combined post office and what would now be called a convenience store. And there was plenty of room in the backyard. The backyard was, was as far as I wanted to roam. And so I'd collect butterflies and I'd tear logs apart and, and look for beetles and, and just generally. So the, by the time I got to college, I had a, a decent collection, showed it to the, the entomologist there, the resident entomologist, and he'd just lost his technician that, it, that took care of the small collection. And I guess it impressed him enough that he gave, it, gave me the opportunity to work on it. So I got to play in a, in a collection for, for the next four years. Um, whatever keys I found, I would try. Um, butterflies, dragonflies, diving beetles, whatever. And among them was Hurd and Michener's megachyline bees of California. So I worked up the osmiines the best I could without reference material, my first acquaintance with Megs. The first discovery, <laughs> the first new species came right after college, so shortly after graduating from college and getting married on the same day, I don't recommend. We were on our way to the Trinity Alps wilderness area of Northwestern California. I was headed for a master's in teaching of biology, but I wanted my research to be about bugs, not textbooks. Packed seven miles in from the trailhead, we spent days hiking in the wilderness, collecting bees and wasps. We were also looking for nests of one of the tiniest of predatory wasps, Pulvero monticola, that my mentor, Lloyd Amy, had recently described. We did find nests, but following a burrow that's 
that's 1.5 millimeters in diameter in soil with roots and pebbles was entirely unsuccessful. But one day, we scrambled up to the top of Triforest Peak, and near the top, we collected a few different looking bees with odd looking antennae, ones I could not place. And I might say at this point that um, your, your picture of, of Hoplitis emarginata looks, was much better curated than my um, specimen I dragged down off the mountain. Upon um, return to the college, I ran this, the specimens through and they came to this genus Acrosmia that, that was mentioned. None of the distribution maps for the species came close to the trinities. So this kid from a small liberal arts Christian college goes down to the August California Academy of Sciences and they treat me like a colleague. They show me the type collection, provide a microscope, and leave me to compare my specimens with the types. I had a new species, so excited. Notice the cool antennae on this male. Um, yeah, I wish you had your picture up. Um, <laughs> um, on this male, and notice that it's got a flattened antenna, and each of the flagellar segments has a, has a fringe of hairs underneath it until you get to the very end where it, where it kind of makes this point. And, and there it's, it's a furry little, little patch. So, the, so a very strange um, antenna in, in the world of bees. The first new genus came a couple of years later when we moved to Southern California's high school teachers. The Mojave Desert was our backyard drawn to what is now the Mojave National Preserve and the lack of knowledge about its bees and accompanied by our nets, we collected on the new, to us, desert flora and especially phacelia. Here it's shown surrounding a Joshua tree. But this, this bee that, that's pictured here wasn't under that Joshua tree. It was on a phacelia, yes, but it was up on those mountains behind in the background there. It was only found under pinion juniper or pinion pine. In the duff, there was a different species of Phacelia and the bee was, was regularly found there. Um, again, it was this odd thing. Um, it had the form of a Chelostoma or Horides. So the, these are a couple of megachylid groups in the, in the Osmiaine uh, clade. Uh, but the red color was really unusual. And I'd never seen abdomens where the margins were incurved like you can see in this specimen or this, this image. Um, but what was really crazy is if you turned it over, and this is a female, you turned it over, yes, there's the usual brush of hairs where pollen is transported in megachylids. But in addition to that, on the very last plate underneath, was this triangular protuberance or, or platform. And if you look at the very base of the, of the underside of the abdomen, there was this long projection that came out and then truncated, ended squarely. And it was about the shape that looked like it might go along with that triangular platform on six, on S6. I still, I mean, this is, this is more than highly unusual. You don't have modified female venters in the abdomen. It just doesn't happen. And, and so I still don't know what's going on, but what it looks like might be is that it's actually able to curl its, its tail under and that those two things would, that, that projection and the platform would come together. For what purpose? I don't know. I thought maybe I could, <laughs> I could find out by putting out trap nests, because it really, these long skinny bees like this are most likely um, nesting in, in holes in wood. So I put out a bunch of uh, block traps uh, one year in the, in the Mojave Desert where it, where it only exists and um, where I had collected in the past. And, uh, but it unfortunately was a year when it was, when it was just perfectly dry and the facility didn't bloom. Uh, some, someday, maybe. Discovery is sometimes intentional. More often, it's unintentional. One spring drawn by an exceptional bloom in Southern California, while here in Cache Valley, 
in northern Utah, um, the, the land was still clothed in white. Our family traveled there. It was indeed a stellar year of bloom, but shortly the view was drowned in abundant rain. So we headed for the desert and the warmest place we could think of, Death Valley. Arriving at the dunes in the late afternoon, we enjoyed playing on the sands. At dusk, we headed for the car. Suddenly Rhonda calls out, Suddenly, um, <laughs> Rhonda calls out, there's a bee in the, on this flower. Watch it, I hollered and ran for the car, grabbed a net, fortunately had a permit, and managed to net a number of specimens in the dying light. They proved to be Perdida of the subgenus Xerophasma, a subgenus that I and an undergrad, Wednesday Miller, had just finished revising, we thought. We added this new species. And the fun for me was that Rhonda didn't know anything about this until I handed her the reprint. But notice the, the, the interesting coloration, and this is not a normal perdida. It's all these, um, well, it's the kind of thing you might expect at dusk. I've since learned that new species can be common. Frank Parker and I spent any chance we could going down to collect in the San Rafael Desert of central Utah. Of the 333 species we found over the years, 40 of them were new. And, and I think what's, what's the constant across all of these things is going to places where other people haven't been or, at, or being out at times that other people aren't thinking bees would be around. And, and that's, that's where um, discovery comes, at least discovery in, in species. The other thing that happened out in the San Rafael Desert is I was finally with successful, I was part of a successful team, Frank Parker and I, um, who was my boss and, and as well as, um, as well as my uh, leader. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we found these volcanic, volcanic uh, cones of sand dotting the surface of the ground. We decided to dig one up. Um, I don't know what made us think that this would be a small project. Um, it was almost nine feet deep before we finally came to the cell with pollen. And it was only later that I reflected on the fact that my head had been in the bottom of that hole following that tunnel with eight feet of sand above it, sample size of one. These discoveries all happened in, in a moment, if, if you will, um, but that really isn't the normal. That's seldom the case. Most discoveries take time. It, it takes time, for example, to learn a fauna. Another vacation trip to California, a visit to Pinnacles National Monument, lots of flowers, permission to collect. So I come back a few months later. I'm back with a box of bees for show and tell. And I guess they were impressed enough to fund more extensive work. So for the next three years, Olivia Messenger, an undergraduate then at Utah State, spent her springs collecting along the trails and in the meadows of the inner South Coast Range of California. It's, a, it's, a, it's an area of primarily of chaparral, dense chaparral, uh, with scattered oak woodland and, and very limited ripe repairing areas. Um, it's about the size of, well, it's, it's 100 square kilometers, roughly. It's essentially six miles by six miles. Um, not a big place. You could walk from one side to the other. In, you didn't need it the whole day to do it. Um, so, that study across the four years, three, three that she did and the first initial that we did, um, mostly along tra trail segments at, at fairly uh, rapid uh, turnover time, se at seven to 10 days, resulted in, in almost 25,000 specimens. Um, and I want you to notice, documented 401 species in this one small area. But right about now, you might be thinking more about that 25,000 specimens. 
Yeah, that's where all the bees went. And that's a reasonable concern, but um, a reality check. <laughs> Those 25,000 specimens divided by the number of species, divided by the number of years, represent on average 15 specimens per species per year. And this is across an area of 36 square miles. So I think uh, we need to be aware of this. We need to be cautious, um, but also realize that um, particularly in these kinds of environments, the only way you're going to um, be able to, to identify when there's that much diversity, um, multiple species of Perdita, for example, or Dialectus, or any number of other um, small, difficult to identify things, um, th there's no way without, um, without collecting. Since then, we've gotten to follow up on the original study and included the additional lands that were added at the same time Pinnacles became a park. This time, it's a grad, it was a grad student, another grad student, uh, Joan Miners, with new methods. We were using one hectare plots, slightly longer sampling intervals, more collector days resulted, and more specimens, but not as many species. And I don't think that represents that some change that had occurred. Rather, there, there's a couple possibilities. One is, one might suggest that if inventory is the goal, opportunistic collecting is superior to standardized plots, that, that being restricted to those plots means that, um, that the bloom, the, the different kinds of flowers that, that different bees might go to are not in your plots, you're, you're restricted to that. It's great if, and if you want, as, as we do, if you want to have some um, baseline to, on which to compare the future. Um, so yeah, so 335 and if you, 355, and then if you, um, put, if you put those together, the, the summary um, is that there's a remarkable diversity. Uh, at that time, it was the most species of any, um, any small area in North America um, with significant floral specialization, more than a fourth of, this, of the pollen collecting species uh, seem to be specialists. Um, and it's a dynamic system with rapid turnover within a season. Um, you, uh, half of the species turning over every month and also with, with interannually um, major change. In, in fact, so much so that, that a about a fifth of the species were detected in only one year. The, the story isn't over yet. Uh, soon we'll have a chance to check on the status of Pinnacle's bees. Abigail Lanner, a, a current grad student, and Brooke Boudot uh, resampled the same plots with the same protocols this past spring, and we'll do so again this year, in fact, heading out shortly. And so we'll be able to, they'll, they'll, since they're doing those same plots in the same way, we'll be able to see if there's been any change in the fauna. Well, Olivia came back from that first study of Pinnacles wanting a project of her own. Now a graduate student, she was ready to take on a much larger piece of real estate. And so GSANM, the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in the southern part of the Colorado Plateau in Utah, uh, became her seasonal home for the next four years. It was a plot-based study primarily, five, 55 one hectare plots across a very large <laughs> space, um, sampled bi-weekly for, for an hour and a half in the morning in the afternoon by two collectors. So consistent in the, in the way in which they were sampled um, across the entire flowering season. Um, and it yielded a lot of bees again, 42,000 plus. And the result was 566 bee species. That's a lot of bees, even in, in a big space like that. And, um, and what's, what's fun also is that we were able to, to document relationships with 149 plant genera. 
the crew uh, also did opportunistic collections. Um, and with those, it, it doubled the, <laughs> the total number of specimens um, that they were collecting. Obviously, we're finding places in, in better bloom than maybe the plots were providing. Um, it did add um, 90 species to the, to the total for the, for the monument. And it did add, add to our knowledge of the plant genera as well. Smooth peanut butter is not the metaphor for how bees are spread across the landscape of, Gia, from, of Grand Staircase Escalante. Um, just look at this chart. Um, while, the, while there were decent numbers of both species and specimens, individuals, um, look at the range. Um, range of one to 111 species in a, in a, in a one hectare plot. Um, and up to over 2,000 specimens um, from one. And I can, with some certainty, say that the plot that yielded one specimen across the entire season was not the favored plot to be assigned to. But I think that the, the, the bottom line here is, from the bees' perspective, this is a very patchy environment. There are places that are very good to live and there are places that are lousy and, and are pretty much avoided. There's another way um, in which bees are not evenly distributed. They're not evenly distributed across the season. Um, there's a mid-summer hiatus. Why? Well, bees follow flowers, flowers follow water, snow and rain drives the spring bloom and then it dries out and, and what comes in the fall are the monsoons to bring on that late summer fall bloom. And it's interesting that, that there's different contributions of, of the bee groups to those two peaks. In the spring, is prime, the drivers are Andrina, Serotina, Osmi, Osmiines. Um, they're mostly spring bees. Whereas in the, in the summer, fall, those are, all, in fact, those are those three blue ones here. In the fall, um, the, the big driver is our panergines and particularly Perdita. What's, um, what's notable in addition to that is this orange where, where it's, Caledes is the, really the only group that has this dual peak, uh, both spring and fall, about equally present. Well, we've been <laughs> conducting studies such as Pinnacles and Grand Staircase Escalante now for several decades, stalking small game in the Wild West. There are clear patterns that, that emerge from this. From these studies across, um, all the way from near the Pacific coast, there's Pinnacles, all the way over to Carlsbad Caverns in Southern New Mexico. And crossing from the Mediterranean into the montane of, of Yosemite and thus through the Mojave and, and the Mojave desert, desert and cold deserts um, such as the Colorado Plateau and the Great Basin all the way to the Chiricahua, uh, I'm, I'm mean, sorry, the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, and what's, um, just, Here's pictures of these diverse uh, ecosystems. Um, and, and what's interesting is that despite these, this great disparity in, in landforms and, and weather and whatever you want to use, um, they are consistently uh, rich, contain dis rich faunas. Um, in, and in aggregate, these, these groups um, include almost half of the Western US fauna. So I, I think one of the messages here is, is that conserved lands are, are great reservoirs of bee diversity. Yeah, so here's, here's the numbers. These rich faunas, uh, whoops, let's call that 450 there. Um, 
but all the way up to 689 species in, in uh, Southern Nevada, um, but consistently rich bee faunas, no matter the size of the study. Um, and these, these um, also show that there's, there's ma major additions to the known bee fauna to be made. New species across all of these um, places that we've worked. There's another thing they have in common. Here, where it's illustrated for Carlsbad Caverns, rare is common, common is rare, and and the the way I'm trying to express this or show this here is um, where each one of these bars represents a bin that's twice as big in terms of the numbers, twice as big as the previous one. So one, double at two, double at four, double at eight, et cetera. Um, and so um, you get up here and, and the, the very largest bin is one that goes from 2,000 to 4,000 specimens. So these, this is the number of specimens. So we counted the number of specimens of each of the species, drop that species into the appropriate bin, and you get this kind of a graph where the, mo the most, <laughs> not the most, oh, sorry, I moved that too, too far ahead. Most of the bees are very uncommon. There are only a few species that are very common. Um, the mean number of specimens per species was 75. So uh, the, the actual numbers are not so important as, as the relative point of it. The, the mean is, is at 75, but the median uh, number of um, specimens per species is seven. So half, half of the species are, are below seven. Um, and you can see that's, um, yeah, 60, 80 species um, are only found either once or twice, one or two individuals. So highly skewed. And, and it's not unique to, to Carlsbad. Um, all of these uh, have that same pattern um, where blue is a, a singleton across the entire study, multiple years in most of these, and, and then doubletons um, in, the, in the red. Where do the specimens coming from these studies go? Well, to the, largely to the U.S. National Pollinating Insects Collection here in Northern Utah, where I work. And it's not just the results of these intensive studies. Take a collector, one Frank Parker, net in hand, and bees come in from every continent. Take another person, do the same, a different pattern of, pattern of collection results. Multiply that by many collectors and the coverage gets to looking pretty good. There, I, I recognize there are many holes yet. <laughs> um, and what you end up with is the US National Pollinating Insects Collection with approximately 1.5 million specimens, and, and as we, we saw, really worldwide coverage. Why do, what's this have to do with discovery? Well, such a collection is a trove of distributional data that can be mined for exploration and discovery. And it represents new avenues for discovery if, if you can extract that data. Um, it can potentially address questions of how the world looks from a bee's perspective. Um, so that's, that's exactly what we've been trying to do. While, you know, and, and while collections are the primary source of data, the data directly comes from um, either, either from the museum itself through databases or um, secondarily through publications or the data in uh, data aggregator programs like GBIF. W wherever it comes from, 
the important thing is it has to be digitized. The data, ha we, we need to know the data and it has to be georeferenced. The result of this effort to, to put those <laughs> data sets together um, is over 460,000 unique species site records here mapped as density of collecting effort on 25 by 25 square kilometer grid cells. The spread of coverage across the country at first plant looks, looks quite good, but it's mostly too thin to pro provide any flavor. Uh, taxonomic coverage is good, um, over 4,000 species. Um, that's more than three fourths of the described North American fauna. Um, but as I said, it's a, it's, it's a bit thin. The question then is, is how to analyze the data. One could map B records onto political units like countries, states, counties, but a state or even a county can be a, have many different environments in it. It's, the, the sizes vary a lot, obviously. Um, or one could use a set of grid cells and convert each into a number of species, but that would largely be a reflection of collecting effort. So our first attempt at this, um, we're using, for this, we're using ecoregions. Now we can get a bee's eye view of bee distributions. Generic richness differs greatly, you can see across North America. It's, it's, and it's highest in the boundary states, in the borderlands, the Chihuahuan Desert, the Sierra Madre, Occidental, Pine Oak Forest, followed by other hot deserts, the Sonoran Desert, the Mojave Desert, and the um, Mediterranean areas, and finally up here into the uh, cold deserts, if you will, the, the uh, Great Basin and the Colorado Plateau. Uh, but there's this significant um, uh, diversity, uh, even, even down into Central America is greater than the Eastern United States. Um, so that there's this, there's a definite longitudinal uh, trend in the, in the bee diversity. At the species level, um, it's, there's a little shift here to, to the Great Basin and the Colorado Plateau. Um, but again, the, the center of, of diversity is in this southwestern portion of the country. Um, so here, just just in, just to follow up, um, this this general tr trend of of western southwestern abundance, um, but slight differences between the two. We can also explore the distribution of endemics, here shown as the number of species only found in one ecoregion. Notice that there are few, none or, or less than 10, across the northern part of the continent um, and, and in the eastern part of the United States. So not only is the southwestern US and adjacent Mexico rich in genera and species, it also has high levels of endemism. Note also, that there is this uh, element of endemism in the, in the tropics, in the tropical Ismian, Ismanian, Ismian, sorry, Atlantic moist forests. Well, one could ask what's the contribution of different groups to this diversity? Um, well, let's, let's look at a few. Here's, here's the, the polyester bees. The, the Kalides, the Kalitines. And notice that, that um, they're re relatively well distributed and present across uh, both North and South America, and additionally across um, moist and dry areas in both uh, North and South. Um, Whereas something like the orchid bees, um, a truly tropical group, um, is, is almost exclusively in the tropical areas um, with the highest diversity in, in the mid-latitudes or around the equator. 
Um, and I, I should point out this, this extension uh, into um, more temperate North America is, is a bit misleading. There is likely only one species, one Euphrasia, that is resident um, in the US. Uh, but that's another story. What about uh, mason bees? Here you have a, a group that's exclusively, well, almost exclusively North American. Um, it does, we fairly recently found uh, Horites in the extreme Northern part of Colombia, but otherwise it's all in North America with the center of diversity in, again, in the Southwest uh, US and, and Northern New Mexico. Um, it's interesting that it's sister taxa, the, the Carter and resin bees, um, while they have the similar distribution in North America, they are also very well represented in South America. Why Osmia has not been able to make the leap, who knows? Um, well, again, this is a bit of my uh, confession. For a long time, I was a classical taxonomist. It was just about collecting bees and wasps, identifying and describing not particularly interested in the ecological and biogeographical context. But you know, when, when one begins to ask questions like, why are bees so diverse here and not there? Why are just, are, why are they, are the bees just on this plant when there are apparently so much, is so much reward on this other blooming plant? Then discovery turns to context. There are just some plants that grab all the attention and for some bee species, so much so that they have a binding agreement for exclusive services. One such plant is creosote. 162 bee species have been recorded on it. 21 of those are specialists. I'm gonna show you several others like this. Helianthus, the sunflowers, again, a large number of bee species recorded few more specialists, 39 specialists. And that's maybe not surprising because Helianthus has an even larger um, number, probably because it's very widespread. It's not restricted to the hot deserts as Laria is. Penstemons, the beard tongues with their gated flowers still have a large following. And uh, notable is that their specialists are morphologically adapted to, to reach to the, the nectar and the pollen in these, um, in these uh, uh, bilaterally symmetrical plants, flowers. Oops. Spheralcia, globe mallows line roadways presenting their open flowers or, or sometimes there's even fields of them. Um, what is inter interesting about this plant is the diversity of bee genera that have um, generated specialists on this plant. There's, there's 11 genera uh, with, that are specialists, that have species specialists specializing on Spheralcia. So, and all of the families of bees are represented in those. But there's nothing like the dominator. Rabbit brush in the late summer fall pollinator market. Four hundred and eighty-two bee species. A lot of resources there, you might say. <laughs> Maybe it's not surprising. Yeah, those those four hundred and eighty-two bee species we've documented represent an eighth of the U.S. fauna on a single plant, um, and that's based on almost twenty thousand records from six hundred thirty-three locations, and in, in SMAF you can see it's it's really widely distributed. So many different habitats and and climates, and um, and it's a magnet. Well, um, I want now to take this theme of discovery in another direction. Sometimes it's following other tracks and then going beyond. It's a reminder of the importance of viewing biological traits as hypotheses, not facts. And, and I, I, I want to be clear, this is not a criticism of pre previous work. We so often have to go on, on what we have, on the limited data available to us. So the case of Kalidi Steve and I, it's a beautiful bee, 
one of the largest in the US. And it's only known from sand dunes and has been thought to be restricted to the Colorado de desert portion of, of the Sonoran Desert in Southern California. There, they were thought to be Laria specialists um, and obligate samophytes, uh, just only found on dunes. They fly really early in the morning, really early, before the sun is actually over the horizon. Um, you have to camp right there or get up at an ugly hour. Um, and, and again, that they were known only from uh, Riverside County, from the desert parts of Riverside County in California. Numerous dawn to dusk collections on Laria by Hurd and Lindsley in the 1970s at mostly non-dune sites across all three hot deserts yield no Khalidi Steve and I. More recent Laria studies by Minkley et al. found Steve and I at only one of the 47 sites they sampled. Again, most of those would not have been dunes. So there was still nothing to say that it was anything but a rare endemic to the Colorado desert portion of the Sonoran. Except it wasn't. <laughs> Buried in a paper on the bees of Sand Mountain in the middle of the Great Basin, where there is no creosote, was a record of Khalidi Steve and I shown here in this green. That's a long ways away from the Colorado Plateau. And, and I guess it's, again, it's a reminder that, that traits as we know them need to be viewed as hypotheses. There's always, or maybe not always, but there is certainly possibility of discovery of, of new information that, that might change the way we view the, what traits they have. Traits they have. Rebecca Andrus uh, took this conundrum on as a graduate student. She conducted systematic sampling on and off dunes. And she sa also sampled co-flowering plants. In addition, we conducted searches of museums for unidentified specimens. And the result was, um, firstly, that, that Rebecca confirmed that Kalides is dune restricted. It is a dune obligate. The study documented the, the presence, its presence in many more places, um, including three of the five Great Basin um, dunes that she visited and nine of the 11 Mojave Desert dunes. Um, what's uh, interesting is that the two Mojave Desert dunes where Steve and I is apparently absent, are the ones open to OHV recreational use. Um, there may be a relationship there. And I guess the, the, the question that also comes to our minds is, since creosote isn't up there in the Great Basin, what is Khalidi Steve and I using? And, and what Rebecca found was that it was Sorothamnus, um, indigo bush throughout the Great Basin, obviously, because there's no creosote there. But, but um, and, and then at the other end, um, all the Sonoran Desert sites and most of the Mojave sites, um, it was exclusively uh, found on creosote bush. So, but it, at the interface between the Great Basin and the Mojave, um, it was on both. So, a bit more known. And maybe this is not the, the last word. Maybe there's, it's on Sorothamnus down deep in the Colorado desert. I don't know. Well, and finally, um, a reminder uh, that fieldwork is not the sole domain for discovery. We have a current effort that was, that was already mentioned um, to identify bees that have or could invade the US easily um, to, to provide a, a me mechanism that, that anybody can use. They don't have to be um, connected with a university and have just the right keys. Um, and I'm only lightly involved in this project led by Skylar Burroughs and, and Laurie Spears. 
um, and um, you already got a, a, a note to, for this, um, but I, I will re recommend it again. It's gorgeous pictures. Um, so, but my part has been that, that um, because an old world pseudoanthidium was found in, in North America and now is, is demonstrably um, made its home here and, and it's expanding its distribution, um, we need to be able to detect uh, if, if one kind of pseudoanthidium got in here, another certainly could, and, and uh, we need to be able to identify them. But the taxonomy of the species group is unsettled. And so I spent um, some time in going around museums in, in Europe um, to gather material. We needed to, to work out the taxonomy and to look at the type uh, specimens to, to determine uh, what names were appropriate for which species. And while working through miscellaneous bees in the Stuttgart Museum in, in Germany, I found this bee from Zimbabwe. And since I've been working on African anthidiaine, I borrowed it along with the pseudoanthidium. And its generic identity eluded me. I wasn't sure, um, and it wasn't until I got back, um, home and I, and I got it in the lab and, and looked at it. And, and this, uh, my first reaction, this is, I'm looking at here at, at it from the, from the back, backside. Um, this is the hind leg. There's this, this structure, this protrusion out of the hind tibia. And I thought, what in the world? It must be some developmental anomaly. Looked on the other side, nope, they're matching pair. What is going on here? I've never seen anything like this before. Well, if you turn the bee upside down and look at the underside of that hind uh, tibia, and now the, the, the apex of the tibia, the end of the tibia is, is up in your, in your image, um, there's, here's a, here's a um, tibial spur. Well, where's the second tibial spur? Oh, this is, has to be it. This is the second tibial spur. And if you look, well, I don't know how big it shows on your on your uh, image, but um, there's a there's a cup kind of around the the small the normal sort of normal uh, tibial spur, and if you look if you're able to look if and have a good microscope like I do, this also um, is in a socket. So that not only is this thing a, this strange shape that's that's almost as big as the tibia itself. Um, but it, it is articulating, it's, it's movable. I have no clue what, I've never seen anything like this before. Um, and as a, as a uh, the, 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 the interesting thing is, I, I was ready to describe this as a new genus and I, no, no, I need to check a little bit more. I think now that it's, um, that it's Siphanthidium, a, a very uncommon genus in Africa, endemic to the country or to the continent. But, um, more recently, I was sent um, by Bob Copeland a bunch of anthidiaines from Kenya. And lo and behold, there was not just one of these. There was a series of the female. So it's not some anomaly. Um, and the associated male. So um, this will show up one of these days. All right. Um, remember those gaps in the map of collecting intensity? places whose bees are unknown. A lot of those gaps are shown on this map to be natural areas, national parks and monuments and non-park wilderness. There are a lot of wilderness areas, 13, well, 1,366 of them. And I have a reason for bringing this up right now. What does, it have, what does this have to do with discovery? Well, um, we don't know much about the bees of these protected areas. And, and if you'll notice here, of, of all the records um, we could find for, for places that are protected, the national parks and wilderness areas, non-park non, uh, non wilderness areas, um, half of those are in three uh, national parks, Pinnacles, Yosemite, and Carlsbad Caverns. And, and you know the, a few other national parks bring that to three fourths. And not, no uh, wilderness area 
ha has enough data to deserve even a, a, a tiny visual slice of the pie. So wilderness areas in particular are unknown. Um, so um, just as um, I've talked about uh, my journey um, and, the, and the joy of, of finding things in new places, um, there, there are lots of wilderness areas on the V frontier with nothing known about them. So if by chance you're in the mood for discovery and you live in the West, there may be a wilderness area waiting for you. There may be a journey awaiting you. Well, to all those who go to extraordinary lengths or is it heights to find those bees, thanks. They are the people who deserve the credit for what's, what I've shared with you. Um, and, and particularly Harold Eichard goes by H who's uh, kept things rolling so many times, so many times. And I, and I just, it's, it's been a great, it's, it's, it's been and is a great journey. And I'm so excited to have been able to and to continue to be able to share it, to, to join in with other people on, on their journeys. And so I'll leave you with, um, with some eye candy. Um, the clowns of the bee world, it's a celebration of diversity. And that's it. Wow, that was that was awesome. I'm sure you can hear all the applause around the, the country right now. Unfortunately, in Zoom land, uh, we don't get that kind of um, feedback, but that was amazing. Um, we'll do a, maybe a maximum of around 10 minutes of questions. Um, but if we have people that want to keep going, we can keep going for as long, long as you'd like. Um, we have quite a bit of thanks in the chat there. Um, so from Merrick Stanton, um, Terry, why don't you, uh, can you put your slideshow um, just from that same slide and we can keep that up during the Q&A? Sure. Let's see if I can. Uh, from, cur from current slide. Yeah, yeah. from current yeah. slide. Yeah, let's, good, good, good. Right. <laughs> I thought I might get distracted. Well, yeah, yeah, I am definitely distracted. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what part of the world some of those are from. Um, uh, so let's see, from Merrick um, Stanton um, in California. Is that first discovered Perdita bee nocturnal or active at dusk only? It has large ocelli. Good observation, Merrick. Yeah, excellent. Wait, <laughs> um, it, it, as far as I know, I, I mean, I haven't been able to go back and study it much, but as far as I know, it doesn't, it's not truly nocturnal. And I can also um, imply that that's the case. Um, the the genus, subgenus has, um, what is it? Seven species, something like that. And there are big ones that are even blonde, more blonde and have bigger ocelli and those are truly nocturnal. And so as, as, you, as the ocelli get smaller, um, they appear to be uh, ones that just are at dusk. Um, and yeah, so that's Rondé and two we described from, from the Southern um, Nevada from um, the Mojave Desert. In fact, we were, um, I was just out there uh, with a, a, a grad student and um, we were pinning into the, into the night um, in, in, I'm sitting in the car with my headlamp on and you know you get these tafiyids and, and um, utilids and stuff coming at, at you in, in the deserts and I thought oh that's and then wait a minute that's a bee <laughs> <laughs> found some more of those uh, again this time yeah that's so cool let's see there's a question here from someone named Olivia Carroll and she asks where do you think research moving forward should be focused 
taxonomy of bee species that are in museums or collecting bees in areas that are poorly known or? Olivia, I'll get with you later. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's a team thing, isn't it? I mean, there's some of us that are really focused on, on discovering the, the fauna and recognizing it, um, giving it names so that people know they're out there. Um, and there's other people who, who really are focused on, on the bee plant interactions or, and, you know, are those stable or are those, you know, separating, especially at high elevations. I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a team effort. Um, and I'm glad to participate in, in, the, in the small areas that I, that I know. Um, but the more, the merrier. Great, I totally agree. From an, an anonymous attendee, um, they're going to the Pinnacles National Park this spring. Is there a possibility they might run into your grad students doing uh, their inventory? Yes, yes, and 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 you should and they should talk to them uh, with appropriate social distancing, at least as <laughs> things are now. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one of the fun things, um, I think this happened more in Yosemite, but um, was that, that part of, we felt like part of our job was to, to educate the public to the, to the extent they were interested in, in what we were doing. And, and uh, I'm sure they would be glad to, to share uh, their expertise. Good. There's a series of questions here. Um, and I'll start with the one from Bonnie on Vancouver Island. And she asks, for the very rare species with low abundance that you're finding, what sort of life traits do they have? And how did they find mates? Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, we have to remember this is context. So it, it, where I'm finding it, it may be rare. It, this may be the edge of its distribution. It may not be the right habitats. Um, um, and these bees may not all be resident bees. So, so there's that aspect of it. Um, uh, yeah, as to how they find mates, uh, that's <laughs> that's a that's a big um, big hole. I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't really have any. <laughs> the right um, place at the right time, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, that is part of it um, too. You know, species that that we haven't seen for, for and particular in, in particularly in areas that have a lot of climatic. Um, variability like deserts, um, you may not see something for several years. In fact, um, there's documented uh, cases where bees have remained, they're like seeds, they've been re remained in the ground for, for years um, and then come up under the right circumstances. Or maybe they're the ones that we see because they came up on the right year, you know, this is a bed hedging sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question and this is something that's been brought up a few times, but um, with respect to the, the bee bank or that, that bed hedging strategy in these hyper arid um, ecosystems, well, what do you advise for people trying to study those, those areas and maybe you know, uh, study those really rare species that are not only active on some years? Is there a rush by um, systematists to get to particular arid places when the weather is just right on the certain years? I don't know. I don't think there's enough of us to make it a rush. <laughs> um, but but um, I I certainly get the itch when I when I I, I keep track. Uh, Arizona does a wonderful job of uh, with um, person just just the general public of contributing rain data. And um, so when I see when I see the the numbers go up, I think hmm, I probably need to go. Mm hmm. And again, for those um, r really rare uh, species, do you find that they're more often specialized or not? Yeah, sorry, I didn't finish the answer, did I? Um, well, I think certain, certain things seem to predispose. Um, klept your, your position in the, in the um, food chain, kleptoparasites tend to be rarer than, than their hosts. Um, I think, well, so, so a number of the specialist bees in the Eastern Mojave Desert, which I know the best, um, I think in terms of that, 
of those connections. Um, a number of them are uh, restricted to plants that are also only found in the Eastern Mojave Desert. We're going to be, for example, we're going to be working on um, a, a, what is apparently a rare bee um, that we described that um, exists only in the in the Eastern Mojave Desert, and principally on two um, bear poppies that that are themselves rare, and um, one of them's listed. So um, there, it's you know there. They are already restricted, apparently, to a very narrow or relatively narrow area of the world. Um, How many square miles would that be for those oh, species? I don't, I mean, it's still a pretty good sized space. The okay. only thing is that, um, think about Las Vegas to... Uh, Thousands of square miles. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, I okay. don't... Okay. Yeah, it's, like, it's not a relationship for these species on one sand dune somewhere out in the desert. Um, yeah, I would say that's true. I don't. Um, I can't think of any of the dune specialists that are only found on a single dune. Okay. If you if you were working on on beetles or 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 some orthops, yes, that would. There are wow ones that are on a single dune. Yeah, that's incredible. There's here's a good question from Trip. How much of the data shown in these um, diversity maps um, reflect areas that just haven't had the same levels of research or areas maybe that are undersampled. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's you know, we, <laughs> we tried to pull as much together as we could, but it's an uneven um, substrate that we're, <laughs> that we're working on. Uh, yeah. So um, I think that's, that's one of um, our lab's goals is to, is to go to those, uh, those places and to fill in some of those gaps and, that's why I was, that's why the little nudge about um, check out your nearest wilderness area. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's great. I um, mean, we'll send <laughs> what, what better thing to do anyway than, than go, go hiking in, in, in a desert area or, or in a montane area that's, that's um, as pristine as you can get in our world. Amazing. There's a, a question here from Janine Sharkey at University of Guelph. What's the significance of the singletons and doubletons? Um, to the bee communities? Um, I don't know. Um, I, mean, I think um, we have to recognize that, that we're getting samples. This, we're not, we don't know what the overall, and there's no really way to tell what the overall abundance of, of these species are. These, are. these are relative abundances based on the particular places that we sample. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Again, uh, I would love to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I'm, simple. I, yeah. I'm not going to elucidate much here. Uh, yeah, it's not that yeah. simple to describe. Um, but yeah, these things, I mean, it, it really is true, isn't it? I mean, they, they can escape you. It's not like plants. They can escape you in, in time and space. And um, yeah, and they're only out for most of them for a few weeks. Uh, many of them have very... Um, synchronized and short-lived uh, lives along with some of the plants that don't last very long. So, very ephemeral. Did you get the did you get the center of the of the curve of, of abundance or did you happen to chop it on the on the edges is, is all mm. possibility. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a good uh, regional question here. Has the Pacific Northwest been adequately sampled? Or do you think that the species richness is underrepresented in your slides? Yes, and I, you know, I, I think we, we ought to get together. Actually, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking that that you could fill up fill in quite a few holes. Mm -hmm. I know. Um, At least for marginata. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Ex exactly. I mean, that's you know, that's so fun for me. I, to, to be the first thing I found and, and for you to, to, to flesh it out that it's not really an endemic to the Trinity Alps that it, and, and that it does have this very specialized, apparently specialized uh, floral connection. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, the way, that's the way science works. You know, we, we build on each other's work and that's, that's just so exciting. Just always following the crumbs. <laughs> ah. Yeah. <laughs> There's more than crumbs. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's see, uh, what kinds of permits are needed to collect in those wilderness areas you're talking about? 
You know, I um, you would need to check it out. I the my sense is that it's not the stringent ones um, that you notice. I didn't suggest you go work in national parks. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a yeah. That's a whole different level of uh, um, paperwork and and permissions. Um, yeah, you should um, check out check with your local uh, national forest. Um, and I'd be interested to know if, if you're finding it's difficult, I would, that would be, that would be, uh, I would like to know. That's right, contact your local, um, what a, it would be a federal national forest, USDA US, forest. Yeah, US, US Forest Service um, office uh, might be, or they might put you at the regional office, but yeah, I, I don't know. In general, I, I find land managers are, are, are glad to, to have additional knowledge about the lands that they're, they're uh, that they have to protect and um, and as long as you can demonstrate that that you're you know you're a, a valid person to <laughs> uh, you know that, that you're really uh, going to help them um, I think mm. they'll view it positively. Well, for those of you that are local to Oregon, this is the exact function our program provides, which is training mm. and access and resources um, to be able to do this kind of thing, go into a wilderness area and survey biodiversity and learn about all these amazing critters and plants and everything. Um, and let's do uh, two more questions because this will take another 30 minutes, I think. We'll do two more. Um, and then we'll close it for the evening. So let's see. Um, we'll, of course, we have to do one from Lisa. Um, she says we had good sized fires last year in Washington mm. State. Ground bees may luck out with great flowers that require a fire to germinate. But if nothing much comes up, do they somehow migrate to other areas? Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> my guess is yes. <laughs> Die or go get some food? Sure. <laughs> Um, but, but I mean, that's just a guess. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly, um, well, it's interesting that megachylids nest really shallowly and they're probably, um, they, they're not doing well. Um, if, um, but the rest of them are nesting deep enough, so they're, they're probably gonna come up and do fine. And, and what's also interesting is, you know, a day or two later, a I mean, day or two, year or two later, um, in many, these places, like in Chaparral areas particularly, um, that you get a whole bloom of plants that have been waiting for just this situation. And, and we find that, that the bees somehow find these patches of, that are recently burned that have plants that, that weren't showing anywhere in the area before. We, uh, we saw this in, in Pinnacles, for example. Um, yeah, it's, so, so that I, I think these, not, not directly after the burn when the, when the smoke's still rising, but but a, a year or two, or maybe even more, two years later, when when there's a, a good bloom, is a great time to check it out, and it really hasn't been studied very well. Yeah, it's uh, well. There's some ongoing research, but then we have a lot, so much to learn. It's really incredible. Mm -hmm. So many areas, so many species, so many plants. It's just there's a lot out there. <laughs> yeah. So let's see. The last question we'll take from Sarah Red Laird of Bee Girl Organization in Southern Oregon, and she asks, "Has your data shown any significant losses for any specific bee species?" Wow, you're gonna really work my head. Yeah, <laughs> going to the memory banks there. Yeah. Um. Um. um, um. Are there any species of conservation concern that come to your mind? Um, you know, I, um, I mean, obviously there's, there's the Bomba stuff that people know about it. It's absence data is so hard to find. I, I mean, so hard to, to verify. Um, yeah. Just because I didn't find it for several years in a row, is it gone? I don't know. Um, zeros are rarely and, zeros. But I, I yeah, I, I mean, Bombus crotchii in, in California is one that comes to my mind, um, and I haven't worked enough recently. I know the crew did not find it this year, this past year uh, in Penny. Mm -hmm. um, and 
back in the in the nineties, there was there was a year where there was again this it had burned. The antirhinum was just um, in bloom from from the bottom of the canyon to the top of the ridge, and every uh, almost every plant had multiple individuals of, of Bombus crutchii. Wow. And then the next year was a was a year when they had a hundred year flood, um, and and <laughs> Olivia had to well Olivia was inside for long periods of time, but then uh, once she got out, she had to wear a hard, hard hat, and you know it was just a, a really and the and the whole place was soggy, and and um, did that just trash the the um, population? Um, you know it, it's hard to know what's what's proximal uh, yeah uh, and it is hard long yeah. long term um, mm -hmm. what's it well and critically maybe what's a an ecological effect versus an anthropogenic effect yeah yeah the big question and so yeah. hard to measure these phenomena so hard. well terry this has been um a, absolute pleasure um we'll the have you back mine. sometime i hope <laughs> on the Wild world and, of beef. And, so, and, and, and Lincoln, I have to say that you know what you do, what you guys are doing in Oregon, it uh, makes me envious. This is this is fabulous. I think just involving so many people and and yeah, awesome. Well, hopefully we can get you out here um, once things are settled down. If you insist. So, yeah, <laughs> twist your arm to get you to Oregon. Um, so let's see. Don't run away quite yet, folks. Just give us another two minutes. If you are interested in learning more about native bees, consider joining the Oregon Bee Atlas and the Master Melatologist Program. The Master Melatologist Program is a master gardener type program where you'll learn how to contribute to the Oregon Bee Atlas. The program provides extensive learning opportunities about native bees. You'll have the opportunity to go on bee research adventures of the type that Terry described and contribute towards native bee conservation while making amazing discoveries with the Oregon Bee Atlas. Projects like the Atlas are supported by grants and especially by donations. So please consider giving a gift to the Oregon Bee Atlas at any level um, by visiting our website, which you can see here, or please contact us for endowments. We have had a couple recent donations that is going to allow us to do DNA barcoding on some, um, as Terry described, uh, some of our more um, species rich groups like Lazu Blossom and Perdida, which is super helpful for documenting these hundreds of species in the state. So when you leave, you may be prompted to fill out a survey asking what you'd like to hear more of. So please take one minute to fill that out. Um, otherwise, thank you for tuning in and we will see you when we come back in a few months. Good night, everyone.